Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, is my um, everything is okay? You can see on the screen now. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, so today, indeed, I want to uh, talk about career transport. So I'm Samuel Ponce, and from the University of uh, Catholic de Louvain in Belgium. Um, so the content of this uh, lecture will be, I will first, uh, let's say, briefly talk about different types of uh, ways to, to, to move, uh, you know, charged particles. Uh, then I will, I will use the framework that was developed by Fechano um, from uh, a manually framework, and I will try to show how, by doing a sequence of approximation, you can get the uh, Boltzmann transport equation. And this is the equation that we're going to use uh, afterwards to uh, compute uh, mobility and carrier properties. So I will then talk about and show some example. Uh, in realistic experiment, you are actually measuring the whole mobility. So what is happening there? You have a magnetic field. So how to include the magnetic field? And finally, if you have a lot of uh, carriers, you might have an additional uh, scattering mechanism called the carrier impurity. And I will also talk about that. And I will finish by uh, talking about the uh, resistivity in metals and then give you an outlook on uh, uh, ongoing uh, development. Um, so basically, there are different ways that a charged particle can move in a solid. Um, so you can have uh, the particle move as a result of a density gradient. So this is diffusion. This is fixed slow. So if you have uh, you know, particles in different uh, position, you will have uh, uh, basically charge that will move. Uh, another way is that charge can move as a result of a temperature gradient. And so this is the uh, thermoelectric effect. Uh, and this also leads to what is called the phono drag uh, contribution. Uh, finally, a charge uh, carrier can move in a material as, as a result of an external uh, applied electric field. And when those charges are moving in the materials, they will uh, scatter, so that their movement will be reduced due to interaction with the lattice. So this is phonon, uh, you know, electron phonon scattering. You can have a reduction of mobility due to ionized impurity scattering or because of alloy or, or defects. And so in this talk, I will focus myself on this uh, last part. So how to describe, uh, you know, carrier transport due to an external uh, electric field. So if we come back to uh, what Fichano presented, um, in a manually framework, the uh, current density is given by the uh, gradient of this lesser against function. Uh, notice that in this case, we are interested in the equal time uh, lesser Green's function. And so as uh, Phil Chan showed, uh, you can compute the Green function. So this is the propagator as a thermodynamical average of this Eisen Eisenberg field operator. So those operators are this uh, time evolution of this Schrodinger field operator. And uh, in practice, if you want to solve uh, or to compute a, a Green function, uh, we would like to have uh, that the operator compute. And, and this is not the case in this formulation. And what is typically done is that you recast uh, the Green's function on what is called a keldish schwinger contour. So instead, you're uh, changing your description to be on this uh, contour that also has this imaginary time. Uh, and so now I also have a time ordering operator, but this is on the contour. And now my operator can compute. So in practice, if you want to solve this, what is usually done is that you expand your Hamiltonian uh, now in complex time as a uh, you know uh, non-interacting uh, Hamiltonian, and then you have an interacting term, and then you have the term that interacts with the external field. If you consider those to be small, you can you can basically uh, perform a Taylor expansion in terms of this interacting Hamiltonian and in this external Hamiltonian, and you get the following uh, equation. So you have this non-interacting Green's function, and then you have all these terms. Um, if you express your uh, Hamiltonian in terms of field operator, you use Wick theorem, you can basically uh, rewrite this perturbation uh, series in terms of products of non-interacting Green's function, and you can solve that uh, Feynman diagrams expansion to obtain the Dyson equation that was presented by uh, Fritz Channel. Now, in this notation, uh, the one refers to the, uh, the position one and the complex time uh, one. Okay, so um, starting from that Dyson equation, we can use Langred rule. We can explicitly, uh, you know, um, 
uh, explicitate this uh, non interact inference function. And we can also evaluate our Dyson equation at equal time because what we would like to compute is this lesser Vins function at equal time. And if we do that, we obtain one of the Cardano Bime equation of motion for the lesser Vins function, uh, which is given here. So what this equation tells us is how the lesser Vins function change in time. And uh, the way it changes is composed by these three. Uh, uh, bits. So we have a unperturbed time evolution, and this is the green part in a static potential. We have a what we call a local time self energy. And this is because all these components are local in time. And finally, we have those four expressions which are linked with the internal dynamics of our system. So this includes all the collision, all the scattering. And so this is really the most general equation of motion uh, in a many body framework. Uh, that we can have, but this is extremely difficult to solve. And so what we're going to try to do is we are going to try to solve, uh, so to, to approximate, so to make a series of well-defined approximation to obtain uh, the Boltzmann transport equation. Uh, so the first thing that we, we can do is we can approximate our uh, exchange correlation potential by the non-interactive one. If we do this, the local self-energy uh, can be written in this form. And in addition, if we consider the uh, electric field to be spatially homogeneous, but not, but it can still vary in time, uh, then uh, we can have that this different of field can be uh, written as this. So this is the external electric field, and this is simply the position. And therefore, this allows us to simplify this local self-energy into simply uh, uh, this, this, this formula. So we have this term and then this lesser means function. Uh, now, what we need to do if we want to solve this, let's say, in, in a computer, is that we can project, we can do a block projection of our Green's function and also on our self-energy. So here I'm defining, so this is a definition, I'm defining a block projected Green's function. So I'm projecting on this block wave function. And I can then rewrite this equation, uh, so the, the, this, this equation that we saw before, as this sort of more simple equation. And the only approximation that I have done is that I have uh, only considered the diagonal matrix element of my Green's function as self energy. So this should be okay if we don't have strong band mixing. Uh, and so now we have that this uh, uh, self energy term is simply the applied electric field and then the change of this block projected uh, Green's function uh, and with respect to momentum. And so this is actually a generalized occupation function, as we will see uh, uh, shortly. And so this gives us, uh, if we write stuff, so now I have my uh, Green's function that I have written block projected. So I have the change of my uh, generalized occupation function as a function of time. Then I have this self-energy. And then on the right-hand side, I have all the collision term. In the collision term, I have also rewritten uh, the block projected self energy. So again, this is a definition. So this gamma is the block projection of my lesser integrator uh, self energy. And so this gives us the quantum Boltzmann transport equation, which we also call AC, because in this formula, you can see that the external field can still change with time. So you can have an oscillating field. Now, if we further assume that we are in a DC transport, meaning that we don't have time dependence, then, of course, the first term will just vanish, and we are left with those two terms. So on the left-hand side, I have this change uh, with respect to my occupation. And notice that because now I am time independent, I have sort of this difference of time. I can recast it in terms, I can do Fourier transform, and I can recast this in terms of frequency. And so I can define this occupation function as the frequency integral of my uh, lesser generalized occupation function. And so this is really the occupation function for the state n uh, and momentum k um, in, 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 a, in the presence of a, an electric field. Uh, now, there are still a lot of complexity, and the complexity is located inside this gamma function. So this is the block projection of my self-energy. Uh, and this is very difficult to compute. And so we need to do a series of approximation in order to be able to compute this uh, gamma lesser and greater. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, consider that we are only scattering by uh, lattice vibration. We will neglect phonon phonon interaction. We will also neglect the frequency dependence of the uh, electron phonon matrix element. And we will consider the phonon Green's function in the adiabatic approximation. Uh, and we will also approximate this uh, generalized lesser, lesser at risk function as well as this um, by, by this uh, two pi uh, uh, occupation function. So if we do all of that, 
we then get a much easier equation. So on the left-hand side, we have the same, the same term, but now on the right-hand side, we have all the collision. And now we have this uh, electron formal matrix element that was presented by Feliciano in the previous talk, and we have those uh, four terms. So those four terms correspond to, so they are uh, energy conserving term, and they correspond to getting out or in uh, to the state uh, FNK by either absorbing or emitting a phonon. So this, this gives us four possibilities. And those four, pos four possibilities are basically written in those four lines. Okay, so this is the, the sort of the equation of motion, but what we want is actually the current density. So now the macroscopic average of the current density is the space integral of the original uh, you know, gradient of the Green's function. But now I can do this block projection and I can obtain everything in terms, so with all this approximation, in terms of this occupation function. And we will basically, through the gradient, we also get the uh, carrier velocity. In the case of a weak electric field, um, we can use the linear response of the current density. And so this is actually the definition of the conductivity. So the conductivity is the change of this macroscopic current density with respect to the external applied electric field in the limit of vanishing uh, electric field. And so if I do that, I just have this equation, but now I have to derive with respect to my electric field. And so I'm using this shorthand notation just to, um, to signify that I have the change of occupation with respect to external field. Now, the issue with the conductivity somehow is that this will be proportional to the number of carriers that I have. And so in experiment, it's uh, often uh, more convenient to use the mobility instead. And so the mobility is exactly the same object, but you divide by the number of carriers. And therefore, this is a more intrinsic property. And so this is the definition of the drift mobility. OK, so to recap, my drift mobility can be obtained by this carrier velocity times this out of, out of equilibrium uh, occupation function. So this is how my occupation change due to an external electric field. And then to obtain and to compute this quantity, I can solve the Boltzmann transport equation. So this equation was simply obtained by taking the derivative of the previous uh, Boltzmann transport equation that I showed here. So if I take the derivative, uh, you know, this, van this vanish, and then I get all, I can do some math and I get all of this that becomes this object. And here I also have introduced this uh, uh, lifetime of scattering rate that are proportional to the uh, imaginary part of the electron form of self-energy. Uh, now, finally, we can do an approximation. So if we don't want to solve this, because it's a bit, could be a bit complicated, notice that this equation needs to be solved iteratively because I have this uh, object here and here. And here I have to evaluate it at k and here at k plus q. And so one approximation is to, to simply neglect this second term. And this is called the self-energy relaxation time approximation because it connects directly this change of occupation with uh, this lifetime. And this lifetime is directly connected with the imaginary part of the electron self-energy. And so this is why we have this name. Um, OK. And so now if I want to solve this in practice in a computer, I can indeed uh, solve this equation. Uh, but notice that we have term like this one. So this is the derivative of the, um, let's say, ground state occupation. So this is nothing but the Fermi Dirac occupation function derived as a function of the uh, eigenvalues uh, of my systems. And uh, this function uh, is actually represented here, and it's extremely peaked at the band edge. So if my Fermi level is here, I'm, I'm doing basically whole doping then uh, this function will be peaked and only the state here will contribute. So this is to say that if we want to do such a calculation, so this is a zoom in on a, the diamond band structure, uh, the only states that will contribute will be state very close to the band edge, maybe in a window, which is maybe 0.3 or you know, 0.4 EV uh, around the band edge. So this is for um, you know whole doping. If I do electron doping, my Fermi level might be here, and then I have the same phenomena where basically only the state here will contribute. Uh, you can also see that in momentum, this is a very small amount. And so in order to solve this, we need ultra dense sampling. So this is quite expensive numerically, and so we need to find ways to deal with this very dense sampling requirements. Also, because I need uh, the grid at k and k plus q. Uh, often it's easy to deal with homogeneous grid. So we need very dense homogeneous grid that needs to be commensurate. 
And so one way to deal with this is to deal with, uh, to use uh, interpolation. And this is the idea of the EPW software. So we compute quantities. So this is the dynamical matrix. This is the electron funnel matrix element. We compute them on a coarse grid using perturbation theory. And then we remove the long range uh, interaction and we fully transform them in real space. The reason we want to remove the long range is that uh, once we are in real space, we can do a Fourier interpolation to very, very dense grids, but this is only accurate if our real space quantity are localized. Otherwise, we get Gibbs oscillation and, and many issues. Uh, so this was developed a very uh, long time ago for the case of the dynamical matrix, and this is how you can get basically phonon band structures. So you compute the phonons on the coarse mesh, and then you do a Fourier transform, you remove the long range, you add it back, and then you can compute the phonon band structure along high symmetry lines at a very uh, cheap computational cost. Uh, and so one of the complexity is how to remove this long range part and how to have an analytic form for those long range that we can then add at arbitrary points. And there is a very big literature on, on how to remove this. Uh, yeah, so what are the uh, analytic form for this? Uh, and so I can hide my electron for the matrix element as the this uh, sandwich between the uh, wave function at k plus q and at k, and then this uh, perturb potential. So this is the change of electronic state due to the movement of the uh, ions. Uh, this is written in the mode basis, and I can factor that out, and I can hide my matrix element instead in the Cartesian basis. So this is the atom index and the uh, uh, Cartesian direction. And here I have my eigen displacement vector that I obtain from diagonalization of the dynamical matrix. I can split my electron phonon matrix element into a short range part and a long range part. Uh, and in addition, we can also work in a one year framework, in a one year gauge. And so this uh, object here, these mat matrices, these unitary, unitary matrices U and uh, U dagger, are the one year rotation matrices, while uh, this UW are the periodic part of the block function uh, in this one-year framework. Uh, and the relationship is given here. So the reason we want to work in a one-year framework is that if I compute my matrix element uh, at k equal gamma and as a function of q, uh, this is the real part, this is the imaginary part for two uh, block states, so two bands, you can see that I have a completely random phase in the calculation. So, so you, you can see that it's, it's fully random. Now, if I simply do this one-year rotation uh, into, into this one-year gauge, I get something that is completely smooth, except at the gamma point. And so this is uh, sometimes easier to deal with. And it's the reason why uh, this is used in EPW. Uh, notice that the absolute value, which is here, is slightly different between the two. And the reason is that actually the one in function is actually mixing multiple states. And so here I'm showing the band 1-1 one, one in block state. But here I'm showing the one year function 1-1, one, one, uh, which are actually mixing multiple bands. OK, so now what we have to find is, is a good expression for this perturbed long range potential. Uh, and so in 3D, uh, this can be expressed by uh, this equation, where I have a range separation function x, which split my short range and long range. And in the case of 3D, is given by this exponential. In this exponential, I have this uh, range separation length that can be a constant or can be computed by minimization of the short range uh, interatomic force constant. Uh, and then you can see that I have my dielectric function, also expressed in terms of this range separation function. And then I have this multipolar expansion. So here you can see the uh, dynamical matrices, sorry, the board effective charge and the uh, quadrupolar tensor. Uh, in terms of position, I also have this additional term. So this is the change of the exchange correlation potential uh, um, with respect to an external electric field. Now, uh, this formula is well defined for 3D materials. And in 2D materials, you have a similar expression that is a bit more complex. Now you have an in-plane component and an out-of-plane component. But basically, the idea remains the same. You have, uh, you have this bond effective chart, quadruple tensor, and so on. But now you have out-of-plane component that also play a role. Uh, and importantly, the range separation function is not different. So you have an hyperbolic tangent instead of this exponential. Uh, so those are uh, ways to obtain the, you know, this, this optimal uh, separation length for this formula. So you, it's computed for a few 2D materials and it's computed as the minimum of this. And this will be the length that will be used to separate the short range and the long range. OK, so this is very good. We have our long range interactions. We have uh, this analytic expression. But now, what about uh, this object? So the uh, one-year rotation, and in, part, uh, in particular, this 
uh, block state at k plus q. Because my one year gauge is smooth in q space, so we saw that in one year everything is smooth in q, we can do a Taylor expansion in terms of q and we can write this k plus q uh, periodic part of the wave function as k plus this derivative uh, to first order. And so if we compute this overlap, we will have a delta s p uh, component. And then we will have two parts. We will have something that is connected with the Berry connection. And this term comes from this first order derivative, which is here, and then the overlap that you have here. While the second term comes from uh, this object in Q. And so you have basically a, a K coming from here and the K coming from here. And so those are at the same uh, order. And, and then, of course, you have many more uh, higher order uh, term. But here we stop in first order in, in Q. OK. And so. Uh, numerical calculation have shown that in many, many cases, uh, this term is quite small and is often neglected. So how does it work? So we can compare a deformation potential. So the deformation potential is nothing but a measure of the electron phonon coupling, but we factored, it, we factored out uh, the phonon uh, frequency to make it easier to look at these quantities. And so here I'm showing the deformation potential of this SNS2 uh, monolayer, and I'm comparing direct DFPT calculation. So those are the reference. So those are the, the white dots. And I'm comparing that to uh, uh, one-year interpolation of my uh, deformation potential, so my matrix element. And what you can see is that close to the zone center, I really need quadruple in order to have a good description of this out-of-plane mode, but also of those optical modes. Uh, and I, was, I want to also briefly mention the impact of this very connection term. So it has two impacts. One is to improve the interpolation quality because it's a term at quadrupolar order. Uh, and this is in the case of strontium oxide. This is a bit of a particular case because strontium oxide uh, does not have a quadrupolar tensor. It's basically zero. Uh, therefore, this is the only term that you have at quadrupolar order. And you can see that the interpolation quality improves by adding this very connection term. The other uh, impact is a bit more subtle and is linked with uh, gauge covariance. Um, so the fact is that when you do the calculation, you can have your one-year center that sit in your primitive cell and you get some result. Uh, but in, in principle, if you move your one-year center into the next periodic cell, the result should be the, the same. And indeed, it's the case. Huh? If, you, if you have the result, so this is the, the real part of the matrix element. And if I move by one lattice vector, so this is one lattice vector along the 0, 1, 1 direction, uh, then I obtain uh, basically the same result, but up to a phase factor. So this is the real part. And uh, here, what I'm comparing is the direct calculation. If I physically, you know, in the code, move my atom uh, in the next cell, compare with simply this phase factor by taking the result in the in this primitive cell and just multiply by e to the i q r, and I get the same result. Uh, so this is the, the the matrix element before removal of the short range. Now, if I remove Sorry, the, the long range, and I, I and I look at the matrix element, uh, the short range matrix element in which I have removed this long range. Now we get something uh, more approximate, uh, and in particular, if I start moving my uh, one a center, I will not recover the same result. And you can see that without this very connection term, what is happening is that basically my result go, uh, you know, to different values, whereas to first order uh, with this very connection, we recover the same result close to the in the long wavelength limit. And so this is one way to get gauge covariance uh, of our uh, theory. Now, uh, how does this quadrupole and, and you know the reconnection term affect the uh, calculation of physical observable? So this is the uh, mobility of MOS2 computed by solving this Boltzmann transport equation, so that this full uh, iterative Boltzmann transport equation. And here I'm comparing the mobility computed with dipole and dipole quadrupole. And you can see that the inclusion of quadruple has a very big effect. It decreases the mobility, and it actually brings it closer to, to the experiment. Um, on the right-hand side, I also have the whole factor, and I will briefly uh, talk about that. Uh, I just want to make a small uh, note here, because we will uh, need this during the hands-on. Uh, you, you can see that there are two things that we need to compute when we want to compute the drift mobility. We need this uh, change of occupation function uh, as a result of the external external electric field. And this is what we get by solving the Boltzmann transport equation. But we also need to compute the carrier velocity. Uh, and there are two ways uh, in the APW code uh, in which you can compute this velocity. You can compute it by computing the co commutator between uh, you know, the, this Hamiltonian and the position operator, which can be written as this. Uh, but there is actually another way. You can use 
uh, one year interpolated velocities. Uh, and so I won't go into too much of it, you know, in the detail, but basically this is an alternative way of computing the velocity. And in the code, we have two input variables to compute this. Uh, and in the limit of, of a, a good one-year function that describes exactly, you know, the block state, those two velocity will be the same. Okay, so now in terms of, of result, I'm here showing um, results on, on 10 simple bulk semiconductor. And I'm showing the reduction of electron and whole mobility as a function of temperature. So when I increase the temperature, I, I have more scattering, you know, with the lattice and the mobility, uh, the carrier mobility decreases. And so this is the comparison between the drift iterative Boltzmann transport equation results and the experiment with all the, the dots uh, from various experiments. Um, what is uh, uh, very interesting when we do those calculations is that we can get some insight into the physics and the physical mechanism that drive or that limit the carrier mobility. Uh, so for the same uh, materials, what I'm showing here is the spectral decomposition of uh, this uh, uh, scattering rate. So uh, on the x-axis, what you have is the uh, phonon frequency. And on the y-axis, you have my scattering rate, uh, which is sort of frequency resolved. And when I integrate this, I get the scattering rate that contribute the most to my mobility. Uh, and what we can notice is that the materials display very different behavior. So for example, the first four, those are quite stiff uh, materials. So we have cubic boron nitride, diamond, silicon, uh, 3C silicon carbide, and those are limited by acoustic mode scattering. So, so it's really like the acoustic mode that will reduce the mobility the most, while in the material down there, uh, those are materials that are limited by optical scattering. Uh, and so when you solve this equation uh, uh, from ab initio, you immediately include all these possible scattering mechanisms, and you can see that they are important in various ways. And therefore, if one uses, let's say, models, so like the Froelich model, we will only describe one type of scattering. And so one needs to be careful to apply it to material in which uh, those modes are really dominating. Uh, but of course, it's easier to just uh, use it fully ab initio and do the calculation like it's shown here. And we will do the same calculation during the hands-on. Now, if we want to get a gauge on how predictive or accurate the Boltzmann transport equation is, we can compare our results to experimental uh, mobility. So those are the calculated mobility versus experiment. If we have perfect agreement, we should uh, basically be on this dashed line. And you can see on each side, I have a 100% difference uh, uh, that is uh, shown here. If I compute my drift mobility in the CERTA approximation, you can see that we have Global, we are globally overestimating a bit the result, but we have result a bit everywhere. This is a bit surprising because actually we are only considering um, scattering with the lattice. So we would expect to overestimate experiment because in experiment, you have other scattering mechanism and maybe there is a few impurities, maybe the sample is not perfect and so on and so forth. So this is a bit surprising and this is because of the limitation of the self-energy relaxation time approximation. Instead, if we solve the Boltzmann transport equation and we compute the drift mobility, you can see that we now almost systematically overestimate uh, the mobility as we would expect. However, in practice, most experiments uh, are done using the whole effect to extract or to, to measure the mobility. And so one needs to uh, include this effect. So the way uh, the experimental setup is, is that you have your sample, and then you apply a, a potential and you apply a field, but you also apply a, a, a magnetic field orthogonal to the sample. And this magnetic field will deflect the electron to, uh, due to the Lorentz force. Uh, and this is called the whole mobility. And this will actually change uh, slightly the drift mobility. And so if you want to compare to experiment, at least for those type of experiment, we should compute the uh, Boltzmann transport equation that is augmented by uh, this magnetic field contribution because this will actually change uh, the driving terms. On the left-hand side, I have all my driving terms. So I have the driving term due to the applied external electric field, but also due to the applied magnetic field, which is this term. And on the right-hand side, again, I have all my scattering, uh, so the, all the resistive term uh, on the right-hand side. And so this is a very similar equation as the one we saw before, but we now have the magnetic field. Uh, and so if we do this, then our mobility will be the whole uh, mobility instead of the drift mobility. And you can see that in this case, we overestimate even more experiment, uh, sometimes by a factor of two. Uh, 
Uh, I should just mention that the whole factor is, is a relatively complex object. Uh, and sometimes it increases, sometimes it stays flat or decrease, and also it's not unity. And so one should not approximate the whole factor as unity, but really compute it because you can see that it has an important effect and can also be a temperature resolved. Uh, and so this brings me to the fact that you can see uh, our theory overestimates strongly experiments. And this is because many experiments are actually done with a relatively high density of charge, the high density of carrier. And in this case, we have another scattering mechanism called carrier impurity scattering. Uh, and so we can also try to compute the effect of carrier scattering in order to compare with experiments better. Uh, so uh, what we can do is we can make further approximation. So we can approximate uh, um, point charge impurity to be embedded in the dielectric continuum. Uh, we can approximate my impurity scattering within the first bond rule, which means that we have single impurity scattering. Uh, we can be in the dilute limit. Uh, and also, we can consider that we have randomly distributed impurity. If we do this approximation, my charge uh, impurity scattering can be written as the number of impurity. And this is because my impurities are randomly distributed times uh, this um, uh, basically electron impurity scattering G which uh, is, uh, can be written as this uh, overlap divided by this uh, 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 screening uh, epsilon. Uh, what is very important here is that you have a square. So this means that you have a one over Q4. Uh, and this is something that is not integrable. So in 3D, you can integrate something that diverges as one over Q uh, to the cube, but not Q to the four as, as written here. Uh, and this is because, actually, in reality, when you add a carrier, those carriers will also screen the material. And so if you account for this screening, you can replace this epsilon zero by uh, this epsilon zero plus this Thomas Fermi screening, which is described here. Uh, you can find more, more information in this, uh, in this paper. Uh, and uh, we will also have help from him in the uh, uh, tutorial session. Uh, so in terms of results, uh, we can show the uh, impact of this kind of scattering uh, on the mobility. So this is for silicon. So I have the electron and the whole mobility. And so this is the reduction of the mobility as a function of temperature. In black, you have the result from before. So this is the result where we consider only uh, uh, phonon limited uh, scattering. And now if we include also uh, ionized impurity scattering, uh, with different scattering, uh, different uh, uh, carrier uh, uh, doping level, so 10 to the 16, 10, 10 to the 17, you can see that we have a reduction of uh, carrier mobility also as a function of temperature. And if you plot the same thing now as a function of ionized impurity density, uh, on this limit, I will be uh, independent on carrier uh, uh, density. And this is the limit of the phonon only mobility. But when we reach something like 10 to, 10 to the 15, maybe 10 to the 16 ionized impurity density, then we can see that we have a reduction of mobility that then sort of plateau to a, a defined value. And, and the initial result, uh, you know, match relatively well the experiment uh, for the case of silicon. Uh, one thing that is uh, uh, quite nice uh, by doing this calculation of initial is that we can assess the validity of Matheson's rule. So Matheson's rule is something that's uh, very much used, and it tells you that the inverse mobility is uh, equal to the uh, sum of the individual phonon limited mobility and impurity limited mobility. Uh, and we can compare uh, the, the result with Matheson's rule with the one uh, fully from a initial in which we solve the Boltzmann transport equation, but this time, instead of only the uh, phone scattering, we also have this impurity scattering that appears here, here, and also uh, in, in this term. Notice that in, in this case, we don't have any phonons or any mode indices, huh? but otherwise it's, it's quite similar. And so you can see the result. In black, I have the phonon uh, mobility only, and in red, I have my um, uh, mobility due to impurity only. You can also notice that in this case, the mobility increases. And if I do the uh, Matheson rule, I will have the dashed line that is there. Instead, if we do, if we solve uh, uh, fully from a initial, we have the plain line. And you can see that even though the, the trend looks sort of similar, there is a numerical difference. And there is also a difference with temperature. So the difference with, uh, is sort of bigger in the middle, but it's bigger than, than on each side. And so one should really compute 
this impurity is scattering fully from Babinitio and to include it directly in the Boltzmann transport equation rather than to use a, a matrix locus. Okay, so I want to sort of finish by talking about the uh, resistivity in metals. So everything I've talked so far uh, is, is, is basically related to semiconductor, but what happened in the case of metals? Um, so in the case of metals, the uh, resistivity is actually the inverse of the conductivity, and therefore we can use the similar framework that we have developed so far, and we can com compute the conductivity of metals. So again, we can solve the Boltzmann transport equation and so on and so forth, and obtain the conductivity. Uh, the only difference in this type of calculation is that we don't have long range effect because these uh, long range uh, electrostatic, electrostatic effects are due to uh, sort of polar effect and so on that are only occurring in uh, insulator and semiconductor. Uh, but in metallic system, all of these effect, long range effects are screened. And so we do not need to care about this. And you will see uh, in the hands-on session that there is a flag for this, that you can basically disable the long range and then do the calculation. Uh, now, in practice, a very common approximation in co is called the Zeeman formula, or also the lowest order variation approximation. And you do uh, two more approximation. So you, you consider that the uh, electron phonon matrix elements are constant, close to the Fermi level. And you also approximate this derivative by simply a direct delta around the Fermi level. If you do those two approximations, then one can derive a sort of simpler expression for the resistivity in which we have this uh, Eliasberg spectral functions. So the reason we want to do this is because the uh, we have we can have ways to basically model more easily the uh, Eliasberg spectral function, and therefore we can compute the resistivity uh, uh, more easily. So this is the uh, transport Eliasberg spectral function, and so this can be expressed as the phonon frequency times the uh, mode resolved coupling strength, and the the the, the small transport part is basically the normal uh, you know, mode resolved coupling strength, where we only have this additional velocity term that accounts for the transport. So this is a bit similar to having a uh, backscattering uh, included. OK, and so uh, we can try to see how this performs. This is the case of lead, huh, PB. Uh, and in, in the case of lead, uh, we can compute the alpha square to the Eliasberg transport spectral function or the normal uh, spectral function with and without speedometric coupling. Because uh, lead is a heavy element, uh, you have a strong effect of spinomic coupling. So you can see that the, the red and the blue lights are, are quite different. Okay, and if we use that, we can then compute the Zeeman formula and, and, and compare that with uh, experimental data. So the, the dots are uh, experimental resistivity, and you can see that we need spinomic coupling to be closer to experiment in, in this case of lead. Uh, we can also do the exact same calculation by using the Boltzmann transport equation. And so this was done by uh, Felix uh, Goudreau. And uh, in this case, instead of using this Zeeman formula, we can solve uh, uh, you know, either in the CERTA or in the iterative Boltzmann solution, we can solve the conductivity and invert it to get the resistivity. And we now get also this uh, change of resistivity, so increase of resistivity as a function of temperature. Okay, so this is uh, more or less uh, what I wanted to talk about, but I want to spend the last you know, five, 10 minutes to talk about uh, ongoing sort of work in the literature. So this is basically you know, how to go beyond what I have shown, uh, what are the current you know, direction that um, people are looking into. So those are relatively recent work from the community. Um, so I want to talk about uh, the effect of anharmonicities because everything that I've talked so far is for uh, is within this harmonic approximation. Also, the effect of non-adiabatic phonons that was uh, discussed a bit uh, by Phil Channel. What happened in uh, the case of transport if you renormalize the mass structure? So, due to electron phonon interaction, um, the uh, atom will vibrate even at zero Kelvin, and basically your band structure will get renormalized, and this band structure will also change as a function of temperature. How does that affect the transport properties? Um, there is a way to include that. You can use spectral function. Uh, and so basically how the uh, uh, transport properties are affected by this renormalization. Um, so I haven't talked about it, but basically um, you have a, so of course you, the, uh, again, the electron impact the phonon, but the phonon impact the electron. So in principle, one, if we want to describe the uh, carrier transport, we need also to describe the reverse effect. And so you can actually uh, have a set of couple Boltzmann transport equations. So you can describe the transport of heat 
the transport of phonons and the transport of electrons. You can couple those, and this is described here. Um, you have also uh, uh, something, uh, um, a new development, which is this uh, transport in this uh, Wigner distribution. So the concept there is this concept of relaxon. So this is more for the uh, phonon transport. Uh, but then you can study uh, viscosity. And the idea is that in uh, some systems, the uh, phonon spectral function becomes so fuzzy that basically different branches, so modes, starts to overlap. And then you don't have a well-described picture. And then this Wigner theory can help you when you have such uh, uh, cases. Um, in the case of uh, gallomarsonite, and uh, we'll talk about this, uh, you basically have the what is the effect of two phonon scattering? Because so far I have assumed electron one phonon scattering, but sometimes two phonon scattering is also important. Uh, all the uh, drift mobility that I have shown and, and the framework that uh, we have developed is in the limit of a, a small field, so vanishing electric field. But what is happening when you start having bigger and you know higher uh, external electric field? So this is the concept of warm electron. There is some studies there, and finally how the defects uh, you know, in materials affect uh, our transport properties. Uh, so I will briefly show some uh, work for all of these uh, points. Uh, but of course, I, I, I can provide more information uh, if I can, because I'm not uh, you know, involved uh, in, in all of uh, these uh, this, this works. Um, so anamonicities, there are different ways from a initial that one can deal with anamonicities. A popular way is called SHA. Uh, so this is a sort of uh, uh, approximated way to, to deal with uh, uh, anomalicities. And it, it's very important for systems in which you have soft phonons, because the theory that I've shown is ill-defined if you have a system with uh, soft modes. Uh, and so sometimes the soft modes uh, are physical, sometimes they're not. And so they are uh, you know, a manifestation of anomalicities, and you can then solve it for those kind of systems. Uh, this was already shown by, by Phil Channel, but basically what is happening when you have a strong non-adiabatic effect, how to include this in transport properties. Um, and then uh, one approximation to this SHA is called the TDEP, and this allows to treat sort of uh, some anomalicities, and uh, this allows uh, basically this group to study the mobility of uh, STO as a function of temperature by uh, including some anomalicities. And so this was important because this material has a soft mood. Um, so like I mentioned, basically at zero Kelvin, the due to atomic vibration, and this will also be presented by uh, Mario Zacharias uh, during the course of this week, um, you have the, that the atomic vibration will impact the electronic properties. So your band structure will change. And this is at zero Kelvin. And if I increase the temperature, my band structure will change even more. So this is diamond again. And so you can see in red, basically what is happening is that my state to so my band gap is uh, closing, uh, but also I have a broadening. So this is, called, this is linked with the lifetime. And so those two effects will, of course, change the effective mass. It will change also the transport properties. And so the idea is that one can use a spectral function to try to do uh, transport properties. Uh, so to my knowledge, there is no, not, a, let's say, a fully uh, converged or uh, uh, um, a sort of a realistic result uh, using this framework. So this is, let's say, people are, uh, you know, researching this direction, but I don't know of any transport that has been done in a fully uh, spectral function framework, because this is, of course, extremely expensive. So on top of all this extremely dense momentum grid, you now have a very dense, uh, uh, you know, frequency grid. So this is very, very challenging. Um, so I mentioned this coupled uh, transport of phonon and electron. And so one uh, software that can do this is called the ELF Bolts uh, software. Um, and this software allows you to basically solve this couple uh, electron Boltzmann transport equation that I presented, but there is also a sort of similar uh, phonon Boltzmann transport equation. And if you solve them, uh, you know, self-consistently, you can get access to the phonon drag that I mentioned at the beginning. And this might be important for things like thermal power. And you, you can read more in those uh, publications. Um, for this uh, Wigner distribution, so this is if you want to describe sort of uh, heat transport and viscosity, um, you can use this Wigner distribution function. Uh, but I'm actually also mentioning this because this uh, code Phoebe, uh, in addition to allowing you to do this kind of calculation, also allows you to do calculations that are very similar to the one done in the PW code. So you can also binarize your state, and you can also compute a transports uh, equation. And so if you want to know more, you can read uh, their uh, uh, publication. Um, 
for the uh, the impact of two phonon scattering. Um, so, as far as I understand, the uh, importance of two phonon scattering on the transport properties of most material is quite small, except in the case of, of some very specific case, and galamarsonite is one of these cases. Uh, so you can see uh, in red, this is the iterative Boltzmann transport equation uh, with electron one phonon scattering. Uh, and so this is the reduction of mobility as a function of temperature. And you can see that you uh, basically overestimate experiment uh, quite a lot. And instead, if you include a uh, two-phonon scattering, you can see that this has the effect of decreasing your, mobi your mobility uh, significantly, and you get basically closer to experiment. Uh, so this is a relatively uh, you know, new uh, uh, work. And so the, there hasn't been many systems that have been investigated, uh, but there could be other materials in which these two-phonon scattering processes are important. Uh, now, in practice, if you you know if you if you do experiment, of, often uh, you will apply a large uh, uh, electric field instead of a vanishing one, and so in this case uh, the occupation uh, change quite dramatically. So in blue you have the uh, change of the autofigurium occupation or population of your state for a uh, you know one hundred volt per centimeter uh, external electric field, and if you uh, multiply this by eight, you can see that the basically the population change a lot, and this has an impact on on you know transport properties. So as you increase the field, you can see that this uh, DC mobility is basically going down slightly, and this match uh, the reduction that you can observe in, in experiment. Uh, and so this is also an ongoing work that that's quite interesting, uh, and this allows you also to compute AC mobility. So how does the mobility change with uh, frequency? Uh, and I want to finish with this uh, electron defect scattering. Um, so there is also a uh, framework based on primitive cell uh, calculations, so it's relatively uh, affordable, in which you can compute uh, the electron defect scattering, and you can know more about uh, this contribution in, in this publication. Uh, so in conclusion, the Boltzmann transport equation can be derived or obtained from a rigorous uh, many-body framework. So, and so you can get this um, Boltzmann transport equation. So often it is referred to as a semi-empirical uh, formula, but I would argue that because you can derive it from many body, it's actually a well-defined formula that should not be uh, empirical, but it has a lot of approximation that are well-defined. And now the community is trying to remove this approximation and to go to a you know, more accurate uh, transport equation. Uh, Long-range electrostatic is very important for accurate interpolation. Uh, I've seen, I've shown that you know dipole and quadrupole are important. Um, so this is of course only for uh, semiconductor and uh, insulator, uh, so sort of doped uh, uh, semiconductor. Uh, it's it's of course not important for for metals. The whole factor is temperature dependent and can deviate from unity. So it's important if you want to compare two whole experiments. Uh, it's important to include those. Uh, in general, the BTE mobility will overestimate experiment. Uh, and we can get closer to experiment by uh, including the carrier impurity scattering. So if experimentally the uh, doping concentration is known, then you can also add this effect in your calculation and then get a closer match uh, with experiment. Uh, the same way as with channel, uh, I want to give a few references uh, that are useful in this context. Again, you have some links, so you can download them online and uh, you can read more about them. Okay. Thank you. So if there is any question, I can try to uh, answer them. Thank you, Samuel. There are four questions currently. OK, so I will, I will read them. So why uh, do we use equal time trans function? Ah, so, so basically, yeah, so this is, this is, uh, uh, um, so the, the, this can be shown that, I mean, one can show from, from anybody that the um, transport properties uh, so the 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 uh, carrier uh, density. Let me go back. So basically, the physical current density is uh, uh, at equal time. So we want to know what is the you know the, the the carrier density at a given time. So now, if you start having different time, you're actually describing something else. So we in this case, we only need this equal time one because we are interested in these physical properties. Um, but of course, the green function contains more information. It's a propagator, so it can contain uh, other non-trivial uh, effects that can describe other phenomena. But the current density is defined as this. Okay. Um, 
This may be somewhat tangent, but could we derive a tractable equation from the uh, KGE, maybe KBE, that provide a unified description spanning band transport and localized hopping by assuming? Yes, so, so thank you for, for this question. Indeed, there is also a lot of uh, 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 research trying to have a more general framework. And so, for example, by using spectral function is, is one way to go in that direction. Um, there is, of course, all the, and this will be, um, this will be discussed, I think, on Thursday. Um, so there is the uh, Polaron. And so uh, there it will be shown how to have a many body framework that basically in the, in the different limits can describe transport. So everything I've described is in the sort of uh, perturbation theory limit where you don't have localized uh, state, uh, but one can have a general framework and uh, uh, try to, uh, to address this. Um, so stay tuned uh, for uh, Wednesday, where this will be uh, presented uh, by, by Faye Shannon. But definitely, this is this is very important. Uh, and indeed, what I have presented does not apply to sort of strong uh, localized uh, polar one. Uh, is uh, self energy relaxation time approximation the same as single mode relaxation time? No, 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 no. Um, so let me go back. Uh, uh, Yes, yes, this one. So um, self-energy relaxation time is the fact that you are uh, removing, you're not computing uh, this second term. And this, you can see it as uh, neglecting backscattering of your state in a way. So you're just neglecting this uh, part of your uh, Boltzmann transport equation. And so this is the self-energy relaxation time approximation. The single mode approximation is different, is that you're uh, instead of having this uh, uh, summation over mode, uh, maybe I should uh, uh, clean this. So here you have a summation over phonon branch and phonon mode. Uh, and so uh, often what is uh, you know uh, characterized by single mode uh, uh, approximation is that you have only one, uh, maybe a one Einstein phonon with a single mode. Uh, but here we are including all the phonon modes uh, and, and all the interaction is just that we are neglecting uh, this part when solving the Boltzmann transport equation. Um, if we want to compute the electron velocity at high field beyond the linearized Boltzmann transport equation, can EPW compute the scattering head at high energy? Uh, yes, by volt. Uh, something particular to pay attention for mesh and projection. Uh, so thanks for the, the question. So this is actually something that we are indeed uh, developing. Uh, in particular, Amanda Wang, uh, Wang is, is working on this. So it's not uh, currently available, but we plan to indeed uh, add um, the solution at uh, high field, and they, they, we have sort of mm, different ideas on how to solve this, either by doing some type stepping or by doing a, a, you know an exact uh, solution. And so again, uh, stay tuned for that. At present, this is not available in in EPW. Um, then uh, at page sixteen, let's go sixteen. Where the phonon when you inter uh, interpolated, we perform phonon modelization. No, uh, so the, the phonons, uh, so the dynamical matrix and the phonon are obtained by a simple uh, Fourier transform. So this is the, the same thing as uh, what is done. Uh, so if, if you know the quantum espresso code, this is this is what you obtain when you do a Q to R uh, and then matching calculation. So you simply take the dynamical matrix, you remove the long range, you do a Fourier transform and you interpolate back. Uh, so it, indeed it's not a, a phonon monetization. In principle, what can also, uh, do that, but it's not what is done uh, currently in the PW code. Uh, we uh, do a one year rotation only on the Hamiltonian, so the electronic state, and on the electron phonon matrix element. Um, then, can we use mobility calculated by PW to find uh, magneto resistance? Yes. So, so, if you, and we will, we will do that if you include a, a, a magnetic field, so a finite magnetic field. Uh, then you can you can indeed uh, get some uh, yeah, magneto transport properties. Um, why long range interaction affects the region uh, only around the gamma point in the phonon always? Uh, well, so um, a small Q in the Brillouin zone. So uh, basically, the, the phonon momentum describes a very long range interaction. So uh, uh, the 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 Q. What basically the Q momentum means is that you have your atom that are vibrating and you have a phase. And in the Q to zero limit, it means that this phase has a very, very long spatial extension. And so it's quite natural that um, 
long, wave, the long wavelength limit, so when Q goes to zero, describes uh, you know, long range phenomena. So it makes sense that uh, long range effects are always concentrated around Q equal gamma, because this is what is described uh, precisely by, by the, the Q equal gamma limit, uh, Q towards gamma. Uh, and so when, when Q is equal to zero, this, this means the macroscopic limits, basically. Uh, why inclusion of spin orbit coupling usually decreases spectral function, lambda value, as shown in the lead example? Um, so, okay, so this is, this, this is I, I would say it depends if you're talking about semiconductor. For the, so the impact of spin orbit coupling, it depends if you're talking about semiconductor or metals. In the case of semiconductor, uh, maybe I can uh, show towards the ends. I might have, uh, yeah. Yeah, basically, so this is for a semiconductor. So this is the effect of a, a different approximation. And in particular, this is the effect of spin orbit coupling. So for all these materials, what you can notice is that indeed, uh, uh, spin orbit coupling reduces the mobility, but it reduces the mobility of all. Uh, electrons are almost unaffected. And the reason for this is that when you include spin orbit coupling, you have this valence band and it's usually degenerate. And you are basically, with spin orbit coupling, you are lifting the degeneracy huh, at, the, at the gamma point. So this is my valence band maximum. And uh, this sort of reduces the, um, I mean, you, you basically have a different, uh, more complex uh, uh, scattering channel, and this will impact uh, the mobility. So sorry, uh, actually it will typically increase the mobility because you are removing one of the uh, uh, you know scattering channel. And so this, typically increases the whole mobility in the case of, of, of semiconductor. In the case of uh, metals, it depends. So I don't think there is a typical trend. It depends how your, for example, how your density of state will change uh, around the, the Fermi level, because all the properties that matters are around the Fermi level. So for metals, it's not necessarily the case that properties uh, decrease as far as I know. Uh, is it possible to calculate the transport properties of magnetic system? Um, in theory, yes, it is not possible in EPW. Uh, so for this, we need, uh, basically, we would need the uh, first principle code, like quantum espresso, to be able to compute uh, electron phonon properties in uh, you know, magnetic systems. Uh, and so this is an active area of research. I know that there is some development there. And uh, once this will be you know, fully stable, uh, this is definitely something we should look at. And, uh, but it's quite complicated because then your uh, electron phonon matrix element is, is much more, uh, you know, it's, it's much more complex. You have a lot of diagonal terms and so on. And so one needs to, you know, to, to, to work, but this is not implemented in magnetic system. Um, is the approach implemented uh, in EPW and the mobility calculation available for 2D materials? So it is not available in the public version or the version 5.7 that we will use. Uh, but this is this will be released uh, quite soon. So the, how to deal with 2D materials, and this is why I've presented it today. But in the tutorial and in the public version 5.7, uh, this is not available. Uh, finally, so the last question for SNS2. Let me go back uh, here. For SNS2, it seems that including quadrupole correction will influence a generic Q point that is away from the gamma point. Do you know why? Uh, so, so first of all, this is a range that is zoomed in. in so this is Q. So I'm, I'm looking at the deformation potential at k equal gamma as a function of Q, and here I zoomed in. So it's it's you know it's a small region. Actually, it extends further, and the reason I'm zooming in is because outside it's it's quite similar, uh, and this is because the uh, long range dipole and quadrupole effect uh, you know impacts uh, this um, by construction. The, um, the interpolated result and the direct calculation must match on the grid that you have used. So it, uh, in reality, in order to compute the interpolation result, what we have done is we have used a coarse grid from memory, something like an 888 coarse grid, which means that um, some of these points, I don't know exactly which one, uh, are part of my original grid. So maybe, for example, maybe these points are part of my original grid. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a good example, or maybe this. Uh, and then by construction, you are forcing your state to go through this directive PT calculation. However, all the points that are uh, in between those coarse grid points 
are not used when you do the interpolation. So the, the, all the points that I'm showing, this is just for demonstration purposes that we are reproducing the direct calculation. But all these points that are there, they are not used to get the interpolation one. And so what I'm trying to show in this figure is that you need to treat the long range well. In particular, you need to include quadruple in order to describe well uh, those branches. So there's the out of plane, the zero mode, the LO branch, the TO branch, and so on. You need a quadruple to be able to reproduce the direct FPD calculation. Uh, yeah, so I hope this answers it. Otherwise, I can I can provide more information uh, uh, later on. Okay. Thank you, Samuel. I think there are no more questions. So I think we can now close this session.